Welcome to the exam review of the UK actuarial profession CT3 paper for September 2013. I'm John Lee, a tutor from ACTED, the actuarial education company, which provides tuition on behalf of the actuarial profession. In this video, we'll give a brief overview of each of the questions on this paper, but for more detailed solutions, please refer to our asset, which stands for ACTED Solution with Exam Technique, which gives both model and alternative solutions, as well as a thorough explanation of all the steps. This will be available from January 2014 from our e-store, in time for students' preparation for the April 2014 exams. Well, the paper kicks off with a stem and leaf plot, where we're asked to calculate the mean, median and mode. Well, three marks for just doing stuff from school. The only excitement will be part two, where it asks us which measure we would use to estimate the central point. Well, that all depends on whether we feel that the distribution of the data is symmetrical or skewed. And on to question two. After years of having questions on normal approximation to the binomial, we finally get another one on a normal approximation to a Poisson. We have a Poisson distribution, where claims come in at a constant rate of 150 per year, and we're asked to calculate the approximate probability, which is the giveaway that we're going to use in approximation, that the company receives no more than 90 claims in a period of six months. Did you spot the trick? They told us that we had a Poisson of 150 per year, but then asked us to work out the probability of more than 90 claims in a period of six months, i.e. half a year. So we'll actually be approximating a Poisson 75. Apart from that, very straightforward. And on to question three. Here we're asked to find the expected value, i.e. the mean, and the variance of an unknown distribution. Well, this will be no bother. It's just working them out from first principles, i.e. the mean of x is going to be the integral of x times the PDF of x over the full range. Well, you'll notice that the range is from zero to theta. Integration is not too bad, so fairly straightforward. In part two of the question, we're given an estimator 3x bar over two and asked to show that it's an unbiased estimator. So simply we need to find the expectation of this unbiased estimator, i.e. the expectation of 3x bar over two. Taking the three and the two outside, we just need to do e of x bar, which is fairly standard stuff. So not too much bother here either. Question four asks us about method of moments and maximum likelihood estimation. And again, we're given another oddball distribution, which frankly looks a little bit scary. Part one asks us to show that the method of moments estimator satisfies this equation. Well, there's one unknown, theta. So to obtain our method of moments estimator, we need to take the sample mean x bar and equate it to the mean of the distribution, e of x. However, since it's not a standard distribution, we're going to have to work that out from first principles. So this is going to be x times the probability function that we're given, summed up over the full range of values that x can take, which is from one to infinity. This looks like it's going to be a nightmare, but actually when you multiply the probability function by x, it'll cancel down to give you the constant, which is that minus one over log one minus theta, times the sum of theta to the x, which is just a geometric series. Once you've done that, rearranging will produce the required expression. Part two, and we need to get the log likelihood. Well, fairly standard stuff, except we've got a non-standard distribution. Our likelihood function is simply going to be the probability that our first sample value is x1, times by all the way up to our last sample value is xn. Substituting those in, simplifying it, and then logging it will give us the log likelihood. However, there's a little problem, because what we'll get is the expression that we're given, take away log of the product of all the xi's. So it's not actually proportional to what they've given, since we're subtracting a constant rather than multiplying it. But that said, it shouldn't be too much bother. In part 2b, we need to verify the maximum likelihood estimator of theta is the same as the method of moments estimate. Well, all we have to do is differentiate our expression, set it equal to zero, and rearrange it, and we'll get the same expression that we were given in part one. The final part of the question asks us to give two ways in which we can compute the maximum likelihood estimate. Well, you would have discovered that the expression we get is rather hard to solve. And so we're gonna to have to use numerical methods. So all we need to do is just suggest two of them, say drawing a graph or trial and error or newton raphson Question five is a bookwork question on chapter nine, requiring us to regurgitate the proofs. 
In part one, we need to show that the sample variance S squared is an unbiased estimator, i.e. we're regurgitating the proof that E of S squared is equal to sigma squared. In part two, we need to get the variance of S squared, and we're told it comes from a normal distribution, and they quote the chi-squared result. Well, this is another standard proof from chapter nine. We simply have to find the expectation of the left-hand side of this expression and stick it equal to the expectation of the right-hand side and rearrange it. The question finishes off with another comment question. In particular, it's asking us about how the estimator will change with respect to the sample size n. And you should discover that your expression for variance will decrease as the sample size increases, which means it'll become more accurate. Question six is a quick question on confidence intervals and tests, which should have presented no bother. We're given samples of 25 items from two factories, and we're given their sample variances. And we're asked to test whether these variances are the same. Well, we're going to simply use a two sample F test for that, and there should be no bother there. In part two, we have to find a 95% confidence interval for the variances from each of the two factories. So we're going to be using the chi-squared result to get our two confidence intervals. Again, pretty standard stuff. And then the question once again finishes off with a comment. Well, what you would have discovered in part one is that the variances are not the same. And in part two, you'll get two confidence intervals which don't overlap, which kind of says the same thing, really. But it's nice to know that statistical results have some kind of consistency to them. And on to question seven, which frankly probably was the most tricky one on the paper and asks us about probabilities. This requires quite a bit of thinking. And in the exam, had you panicked on this question, you'd probably been wise to simply shove on and get your marks elsewhere. There are three groups of policyholders, A, B, and C, and we're given the probability for each of those groups of submitting at least one claim. And we're also told how many policyholders are in each group. And in part one, we're asked to show that the probability that a randomly selected policyholder will submit a claim is 0.08. Well, we're essentially going to use the law of total probability from chapter two. To get the probability of a claim, it'll equal the probability that we get a claim, given that we're in group A, times the probability that we're in group A, plus the probability of getting a claim, given that we're in group B, times the probability that we're in group B, and so on for group C. For part two, we again have to calculate the probability that a randomly selected policyholder will submit a claim, but we're given that the policyholder is not in group C. Well, it's a conditional probability, so we can use our conditional formula, which is the probability of claiming and not being in group C divided by the probability of not being in group C. Well, the denominator is not too hard, as there are 40,000 policyholders not in group C out of a total of 100,000. And the top will follow a similar method to part one. So we'll do the probability of claim given that we're in group A times the probability of group A, plus the probability of claim given that we're in group B times the probability of being in group B. And on to part three. Here we're asked to calculate the probability that a randomly selected policyholder belongs to group A given that they submitted a claim last year. So again, it's another conditional probability, but it's the other way around to what we've been working. We want the probability that it's group A given that they submitted a claim last year, CLY for short. Since this conditional probability is the other way around to the probabilities we've been given in the question, we're going to make use of Bayes' theorem. So we'll do the probability of claiming last year, given that we're in group A, times the probability we're in group A, all divided by the probability that we claimed last year, which incidentally is our answer to part one of the question. Part four is where it probably all went horribly wrong we have to calculate the probability that a randomly selected policyholder will submit a claim in a particular year, given that they submitted a claim in the previous year. Well, actually, it follows on from part three. In part three, we worked out the probability that a policyholder was in group A, given that they made a claim last year. And we did that using Bayes' theorem. Similarly, we could work out the probability that policyholder is in group B, given that they submitted a claim last year, and the probability that a policyholder is in group C, given that they submitted a claim last year. Well, once we've calculated those, we could then multiply them by the probability of making a claim this year, given that they're in group A, which is 0.15. Take the second probability and multiply it by the probability that we claim this year, given that we're in group B, 
which is 0.1, and take the third probability and multiply it by the probability that we claim, given that we're in group C, which is 0.05. Essentially what will happen when we do this is we kind of cancel out these terms here. So we get the probability of claiming, given that we claimed last year, for each of our three groups, sum those up will give the required probability. But I suspect most students would have got themselves in the right pickle here. The final part of the question asks us to calculate the probability that a randomly selected policyholder will submit a claim in two consecutive years. Well, this builds on all the previous parts, so if you got yourself in a pickle before, you're probably not going to get anywhere here. Essentially, what we want to do is calculate the probability of claiming in the first year and then multiply it by the probability of claiming in the second year given that we claimed last year, i.e. in the first year. Well, this second probability is what we just calculated in part four. And the first probability is actually what we were asked in part one. Multiply them together and you're done. Moving on to question eight, we go back to simplicity itself. We're given a bar chart and we're asked to calculate the sample mean median, mode, and standard deviation. My goodness, another five marks for doing school stuff. Well, enjoy. Moving on to part two, we're asked to calculate a 95% confidence interval for lambda from a Poisson lambda. This is fairly standard stuff and should have presented no problems. Moving on, the next part of the question told us the average claim size for each group of number of claims that a policyholder made. And we're asked to estimate the expected size of a single claim. This requires a little bit of thought, and I'll start you off and show you how to begin it. In the previous bar chart, we had 40 people who made no claims, a total claim amount of zero. Next in the bar chart, we were told that 25 people made one claim. And in this table here, we're told the average size of that one claim is 1,000 pounds. And so multiplying that, that will give us the total claim amount from those 25 individuals. From the bar chart, it told us we had 20 people who made two claims. And in this table, we're told that each of those claims is an average of 1,100. So multiplying that, that will give us the total amount those 20 people claimed. And so on, and once you've got the total amount, you can divide by the number of claims to give the average claim size. Part four asks us to state the distribution of the total claim amount in the group of 100 policyholders. Well, using S to stand for the total amount claimed, we were told that the amount of each claim is normally distributed. Let's denote it by X's. So this would be the claim from the first individual, the second individual, and so on. However, at the beginning of the question, we were told that the number of claims from the policyholders had a Poisson distribution. So we're describing a compound distribution where N is Poisson, which is called a compound Poisson. The last part of the question simply asks us to calculate the expected value of the total amount claimed and its standard deviation. Well, to do that, we'll just use the standard compound distribution formula given in the tables. Question nine is another confidence interval test question with a little bit of ANOVA thrown in. There's a lot of information given here, but essentially what we're doing is looking at the hours spent in a car before and after a road congestion scheme. Y is the amount before, Z is the amount afterwards, and X is the difference between them, i.e. the reduction in the hours spent in the car. All we really need from this question is the table and remembering that X is equal to Y minus Z. Part one of the question asks us to perform a statistical test to see if the expected use in city A is the same as in expected use in city B before the measures were introduced. Well, Y was used for the amounts before the measures were introduced, and we're comparing the two means, so we're simply doing a two-sample t-test here. However, don't miss out all the marks. We're asked to state the assumptions that we made and justify them. Recall that a two-sample t-test requires normal distributions, which we were told, and equal variances. So we'll need to make a comment about equal variances or perhaps perform a test. Moving on to part two, we're going to test whether car usage has been reduced in city A. That is, we're going to compare the Z with the Y, which you'll remember was denoted by X. Now don't get caught out, we're not going to be using a two-sample t-test here to compare the means, since the data are paired, as we were talking about 10 households before and after the change was introduced. Then in part three, we're asked to calculate a 95% confidence interval 
for the reduction in city B. Again, we're going to be using our paired result, so we'll be doing a confidence interval on a single sample of differences. For the final parts of the question, a third city is introduced. And of course, we're going to be comparing the means in all three cities, and that'll be in part five of the question, where we do an ANOVA. But before we do that, we're asked to calculate the sum and the sum of squares for city A. Well, essentially, all we need to remember is that x is equal to the hours before y minus the hours afterwards z, i.e. the reduction. And so x bar will equal y bar minus z bar. Well, once we've got x bar, you can then rearrange it to get the sum of x's for each city. To get the sum of x squared, we're going to use the sample standard deviation for x, which we're told for city A was 2. All in all, this would have been a fairly nice 21 marks. The final question is, of course, on regression. And after last year's more complicated one, this one's a dream. We're comparing percentage returns on a market compared with percentage returns on hedge funds. And we're giving a scatter graph here. We're asked to comment on the relationship between the two series. Well, it's difficult to tell from the graph. Are they engaged or are they married? Or perhaps they were asking us to comment on linear regression. The rest of the question is pretty straight down the line. Part 2a, we need to calculate the correlation coefficient, i.e. r. And using the formula from the tables, this is standard stuff. Part 2b, we need to test whether it's different from zero. So our null hypothesis will be the true correlation coefficient is zero versus our alternate hypothesis of, oh, no, it isn't. To do this, you'll be using our t result from the tables rather than the Fisher's transformation, which is an approximation. Part three asks us to calculate the parameters of the linear regression model. So the alpha and beta, and if you want to be picky, the sigma squared as well. Again, straightforward stuff, since all the formulae are given in the tables. Part four asks us to calculate a 95% confidence interval for the underlying slope coefficient, i.e. a 95% confidence interval for beta. Again, the result is in the tables, and this will be no problem at all for well-prepared candidates. And finally, we finish with yet another comment question. We're comparing answers 2b, where we would have shown that the correlation coefficient is different from zero, i.e. there is some linear correlation there, to part four, where we got a confidence interval for the slope. This kind of thing has been asked a number of times before, but if there's no correlation, then essentially the slope would have a gradient of zero. Whereas in this case, where we have positive correlation, we should find the slope will be positive. And so you would have found in part four that your confidence interval didn't contain zero, but contain two positive values. So our results tie up. So in summary, a, a much easier so in summary, a much easier paper than April, and indeed some would say far too straightforward, although in questions three and four we were applying our knowledge to unknown distributions, and there are a lot of questions asking us to think about our results rather than just simply put numbers in formulae. But I suspect it would have been question seven on probabilities, which would have caused the most grief for students. If you'd like to chat with fellow students about this paper, then feel free to post on our forums at www.acted.co.uk forward slash forums.